بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إنا أنزلناه في ليلة القدر وما أدراك ما ليلة القدر ليلة القدر خير من ألف شهر تنزل الملائكة والروح فيها بإذن ربهم من كل أمر سلام هي حتى مطلع الفجر صدق الله العظيم Assalamu uh, alaikum jami'an. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Abdullah Ernest. Speak about his first three years in Sudan. Abdullah lived in Sudan as a Sudanese person. And he lived as we live. So his understanding of the Sudanese culture is very deep. And his interaction with the people in Sudan was a natural one, as we call it, authentic. He worked as a professor in the University of Khartoum, and most importantly, he was, as you know, he was a disciple of Ustaz Muhammad Muhammad Taha. Abdullah is going to share with us his memories in Sudan through documentation through photographs. So I'm pleased to introduce him. So Professor Abdullah, the floor is yours. Welcome. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah, most compassionate, most merciful. Thank you, Brother Omar and Azhari for the introduction. Um, pleased to see people here. I don't recognize everyone that's here, but you're all very welcome. Today I want to talk about the light I found reflecting at the confluence of the Nile back in 1977. What I'm hoping to do is uh, share with you a little bit about myself, um, what took me to Sudan, why I stayed in Sudan for nine years. And uh, in the course of that, hopefully providing you with some information that you'll find useful for yourself or for others. This presentation, I'm having I'm working on how to manipulate it now. Let's see. I'm going to try again to share it. Can you see the PowerPoint or no? It's not seen. No, I just see the black light reflecting at the. OK, so that's the PowerPoint. So it, it I'm trying to. Yeah, we, we do see, see it. it. We do black see the PowerPoint. Reflecting. Good. So I need to be able to manipulate it, and that's going to take a second. No. Good. So I need to be able to manipulate it, and right now I'm not. I don't have control of the PowerPoint. Okay. Um, I need to have uh, the capacity to forward it, and and I cannot. Abdul Hajj. Any ideas why I can't um, forward it as I was doing earlier? Mm. Okay. I'm going to try to load it again then and see if that'll help. I'm, I'm, I'm sharing from my, from my desktop. And I'm going to try to reshare it and see if that's the issue. Just a second. Um, it says I have to do a new share. So I am sharing. I'm just going to try it again and see if that helps. I don't know. Let's see. Abdullah, if you, yeah. if you open it first on your desktop, as if you are doing it to yourself, and after that you share, you will be able to. Yeah, but the issue is, uh, OK. 
I will do it again. All right, I see it now. Okay, you, it's okay. Yeah, but just just go to uh, to yes, do it as as show or yes. Okay. Can you yeah, move now to perfect. the next? We're good now. Yeah, uh, everybody. Thank you for your patience with the technical difficulties, but it seems to be on track now. So a little bit about myself, you know, um, I'm the second born of uh, six children to Ernest Belford Johnson and Shirley Lottie Johnson. Uh, both my parents are um, deceased. My mother most recently and uh, in April of this year and my father back in uh, 2010. So part of what I wanted to do here is um, dedicate this presentation to them. Uh, I'm absolutely indebted to uh, their support throughout my life. And even, you know, at my age now, uh, I can see how the decisions that they made uh, in rearing us, the six of us, and in supporting me are still benefiting me uh, to this day. Uh, my father was in the military. Uh, he joined the military uh, after completing uh, college at Historically Black University. He uh, met my mother in 1950 and they married the same year. He met her in 49, they married in 1950. And um, my mother was also in the military. They were stationed at the same military base at Fort Ord, uh, California. And uh, my father was buried at Arlington Cemetery. And uh, this spring, we will take my mother there to be interred with him in his uh, mausoleum. Uh, over the course of my father's life, uh, he, he became um, a colonel in the military. He served in Korea and in Vietnam twice. And uh, it gave us the opportunity to travel around not only the country, but the world. I have a sister who was born in Germany. Um, you know, I started school in Germany and I was lucky enough to um, uh, finish high school, to enter to, um, in high school, I was in San Francisco during the late 60s, which was a good time to be there. And I graduated from college at the University of Hawaii. So I had a very blessed upbringing, and that is really due to my parents. And also the people that reared my parents, their parents, um, both my mother's mother and father. I'm tremendously close to my mother's mother. I'll talk about her, my grandmother Harriet, and also my father's mother, my grandmother, Janie. Uh, she raised me for a while when my father was in Korea. This is um, my parents in 1950 at their marriage at Fort Ord in Monterey, California. This is my mother's mother, my grandmother I was just talking about. My grandmother Harriet, she was a reverend. And this is her brother, my uncle Spex, who raised my mother when my grandmother was working in California. So I just wanted to lay that out as part of, of my foundation. Uh, the family itself uh, is a uh, religious family. I wouldn't say ultra religious, but quite religious. Um, my grandmother and her sister as an example, and they are two of nine kids, um, are the children of Reverend Isaiah Vincent and Mary Lottie Mackey. He was a preacher. He was a president of a mission Bat, um, Baptist association that he founded in New Orleans, Louisiana, where he trained typically men to become pre preachers. And he himself preached at five different churches over the course of his life. Uh, he founded five churches and preached at three of those churches over the course of his life. His wife was uh, Mary Lottie Mackey, didn't attend his church only. She was a member of another church. She was a missionary. She went throughout uh, Louisiana, bringing people to Christ. 
She uh, was a school teacher and she is the um, granddaughter of her father's master. So her father was a slave and he was fathered by his owner who was named Augustine. So uh, Augustus made sure that my great grandmother, Mary Lottie Mackey was educated. And so not only did she have a sixth grade education which was typical of um, children th at that time who were educated but she went on to finishing school after that in New Orleans and had a tremendous knowledge that was passed on and benefited our family because of that. Um, through, through their line, for instance, this is my Aunt Virgie, who I knew and I talked to a lot. She has two sons and a daughter. Both her sons, Walsdorf here in the upper right and Roland down here in the lower left were preachers. Roland had a church in Pasadena and Walsdorf preached in the church established by his grandfather, Isaiah Vincent in New Orleans. The church was called originally um, New Homes Baptist Church and he and it was renamed Greater New Homes Baptist Church and he preached in it until his death just um, a little over two years ago. So I was raised kind of in this context at, at 16. My grandmother didn't believe that we were getting enough religious instruction and so she insisted that uh, the children at that time, my, my mother's children at that time, were, rep, were baptized. So I, I was entered into the church very young, but I was baptized again at 16 because my grandmother felt that that was a necessary step in my life. And when I traveled to Sudan, my grandmother, uh, I left from my grandmother's home. I went from my parents' home to my grandmother's home and from my grandmother's home, I started my journey towards Sudan, heading across country to New York and then flying out of New York in 1977. My grandmother saw me off at the bus station with her Bible in her hand, which she often had. Uh, I myself uh, was focused on sports. My father was quite an athlete when he was in school. And so I had uh, sort of talent in several sports. And in high school, I actually was uh, starting in football, basketball, and baseball at my high school. And my focus was on playing sports professionally in one of those areas when I was in high school. But being in high school in San Francisco started to change my uh, consciousness. I ran into classmates who didn't have televisions in their home. I had a, a chemistry partner who, when they announced that I hit a lot of points in a basketball game over the loudspeaker in the school, she asked me if they were talking about me. And I said, yes, they were. And I was kind of proud of myself. It was one of my, it was my best day actually in basketball in terms of scoring. And she, she said to me, you're a jock. And that was the first time I had heard uh, athlete or jock be used in such a pejorative tone. And so I started to kind of inquire with her what her attitudes were about sports. And her attitude was is that sports was a distraction and that there were more important things in life than running up and down a court or running up and down a field. And that she, she thought that I was a person who was engaged in life at a deeper level than just sport. And that was a very interesting perspective for me to hear and to reflect upon at that time. And it helped me to begin to problematize some of the um, uh, behaviors of my coaches. And I stopped accepting behavior from my coaches that I didn't agree with or that I thought was disrespectful. And this caused me by the time I left high school to decide I'm not going to play sports any longer. I was dissatisfied with the entire institution at the, edu that, at, at the educational level of sports. And I was certainly uh, resisting the idea that African-Americans were only good at sport, that we had this natural talent that we didn't have to work hard to attain. 
and that we were good at some things that mm, required just physicality, but not so good at the things that required reflection, you see, and judgment. And this was a very common attitude, not only when I played sports in Virginia in junior high school and my first year of high school, but also in on each of my teams that I played on in San Francisco in the late 60s. I graduated from high school in 1971, so from 69 through 71. By the time I went to University of Hawaii, I, um, my attitude had changed significantly. Let me step back. Um, my freshman year in school was spent at Hampton University, and that was my father's alma mater. Um, and so my older sister went there, I went there, my younger brother went there. I only lasted a year. And my problem with Hampton was, was basically one. I, I loved the education. Um, I, I loved the, um, of course, the social life, being around so many educated and aspiring um, African-American people was something new for me. I loved that. And I loved the high expectations that my teachers had for me. All of that was wonderful. But the attitude of the administration back in the 70s was one that I couldn't um, agree with. And so I'm not going to go into all of the details now, but I left Hampton after um, my freshman year. And my father was then stationed in Hawaii. So I was able to go to school in Hawaii as a resident which meant that I paid $119 a semester for tuition. And that's what it was costing in 1972, 73. While I was there, I was pumping gas at a, on the military base where my father worked. And I ran into a friend who's still my close friend now, Rod Nakashima and Rod was leaving uh, actually, I was driving through the gas station and we struck up a conversation because his father was military and he was also attending the University of Hawaii. And he told me he's leaving his job at the gas station. And no, he's leaving his job at a law firm. And he wondered if I would be interested in the job. I said, well, what kind of job is it? He said, I'm a messenger for some lawyers. And so I went in, I applied for the job. He went on to become a fireman in Honolulu. And I started working as a messenger in this law firm. And at the time, I was um, actually thinking seriously about becoming a lawyer. And this just happened to be the most popular criminal law firm in Honolulu at the time, Hart, Levitt, Hall. Uh, they did cutting edge cases. Um, the local mafia, they called them the syndicate in Hawaii, was defended by them while I was there. I met some of these syndicate bosses like uh, Nappy Palava, and Henry Hui Hui. It was a very fascinating place to work. But what happened in terms of my aspirations to become a lawyer was that I was close enough with the attorneys for them to talk about their attitudes and how they were feeling at any particular time. And so I noticed that um, the head of the firm, Brooke, one day, was very depressed. And so I asked him how he was doing. He said, you know, I've got to go and plead this case. I said, what does that mean? He said, well, there's no chance of us getting uh, an innocent verdict here. And I said, well, why not? I said, is, is the guy guilty? He said, no, it's not about his guilt. It's about the judge. He said, we've got one of the most conservative judges on this case. And so he's not going to look at this, um, you know, our argument seriously. And so we're going to have to plead. And when I started getting insights like that, is that judges were not only um, you, um, influencing decisions with their biases, but uh, that they were uh, instructing juries in a manner that would lead to certain outcomes. I started to see that the system, the legal system in the United States was problematic. And I started thinking about other directions other than law. I was involved at the time in uh, ethnic studies because when I came to Hawaii, I quickly realized that the Hawaiians had gone through similar types of uh, situations that Black Americans had been through. The local Hawaiian people and subsequently 
Chinese people and Japanese people and Filipino people were placed on plantations in Hawaii. And they were worked not as slaves, but they had very few rights and they were exploited and they were viewed as being less than the whites in Hawaii, even though the Hawaiian indigenous people, right, that was their island, they were kind of looked at as being less. And so when I saw the, the similarities in our history, I became very interested. I took a class in Hawaiian ethnic studies, and then I took classes in black ethnic studies. Uh, one of the things that Hampton didn't have at the time was a black history course. And the, the ethnic studies department at the unit was a program at the time, the ethnic studies program at the time had a black history course, I took it. And then I gradually was able to TA for that course as an undergraduate. We also were active because the, pro, the uh, program wanted to become permanent. This is a march that we were having to the administrative offices hundreds of students to make the ethnic studies program permanent because this was a program that was really talking about the situations of the and conditions of the majority of Hawaiian people, of the, of the people of color in Hawaii who were the majority. The majority ethnicity in Hawaii was Japanese American. We wanted to talk about their, their treatment historically and also the racism um, that was going on currently at that time. And so we were marching to the administration when we got there. This is me in the march. Uh, I was the person kind of put up front to speak, probably because, you know, Africa, African Americans in the 60s were seen as being part of the movement. And so I had that credibility, even if I had nothing to say. But I was I was a, a person who was uh, dedicated to what I was doing and uh, gave this speech at to the uh, Board of Trustees, one of one of several speeches to the Board of Trustees about the need to make our program permanent. And over time, it became a department at the University of Hawaii and still exists today. I can talk more about that, but I want to move on. While in um, Hawaii, I was, I was studying world religions. And um, when I showed up from my course, the course was over full and they gave us an option that we could study yoga with, uh, and, and get a world religion credit for us. And so there was a young man named Doug who was teaching this course and he taught four aspects of yoga. He talked about the history and the philosophy. He talked about you know, the, uh, the physical practice. He talked about um, bhakti yoga, the chanting and the, the hymns and so forth. And so uh, I, I took uh, a class from Doug, and Doug was a disciple of Sri Satya Sai Baba. Uh, some of you don't know this, but when I arrived at uh, in Sudan, my name, the name that I was carrying, was Abdullah Ernest Baba, and the Baba was related to Sri Satya Sai Baba. I was impressed with him because I was impressed with Doug, and then when I saw his picture with his big afro and so forth, I was even more impressed with see what he had to say. And so for a while, I was really seriously studying yoga. I was practicing yoga, it's meditation, it's chanting, it's, it's uh, physical postures and so forth. And I brought that practice with me when I, when I came to the Sudan. And I might be able to tell you a story about that. So I just wanted to add that. Um, I went from Hawaii where I was practicing yoga. I also was practicing Tai Chi and a little bit of Qigong. One of the brothers who was teaching me Tai Chi and Qigong became a Muslim at the same time I did. That was in um, October 1975. And a Sheikh from Queens, New York, who had learned Islam from a Sudanese member of the consulate in New York, woke up in the morning and told his wife that he was going to Hawaii, to Honolulu. She said, why? He said, I'm not sure, but I'm going. He came to Hawaii and within, I won't say hours, but a few days, uh, our community that was practicing, doing, doing yoga, surfing, doing other things together, mostly African-American males, uh, we saw him and we invited him to dinner. And at that dinner, the majority of us became Muslims. That's how I became a Muslim. Sheikh Mohammed just woke up and came to Honolulu and he brought it. It was so clear, so powerful. And he even directed me to Sudan. He said, uh, he gave me my name, Abdullah. He said, Abdullah. He said, oh, if we could travel together to 
Sudan, land of the black man. He said, not Saudi, Sudan, where people live the religion. They don't just preach it. This is how he inspired us. And so this, that was October 1975. And by um, June 77, I had decided to travel to Sudan with um, one of the Sudanese that Sheikh Mohammed introduced me to, whose name was Salman al -Awad. So I'm now uh, on my way to the Sudan. I came, uh, this is my parent. My dad was the commander of uh, Fort Lawton here in Seattle at the time. He was the chief officer there, which is interesting because in his own tra trajectory, um, in 1951, right after he had um, become a junior officer, a, a lieutenant, he was sent to Fort Lewis here in Washington State. And when he arrived, his commanding officer took one look at him, told him to sit down and wait. He waited for over an hour, and his commanding officer came back out and had transferred my father to Fort Lawton to another job. And my father found out that that commander did not have African-Americans um, working under him in any capacity. So that was my father's first experience with Fort Lawton was he was being essentially dismissed by his commanding officer and sent to this outpost. And then he came back as commander of the post. And so it was sort of, you know, the full circle. And this is his home behind him. This is my mother and my sister and my youngest brother. Uh, recently, I traveled to Hawaii. I hooked up with Rod Nakashima, the um, young man I was telling you I met at the gas station who um, basically turned me on to his job at the, uh, hall, at the law firm of Hall, Levitt and Hart. And Rod and I are still close. We talk on the phone regularly. And when we got there, he met us at the airport with Lays for myself and my daughter, Sumaya, named after my teacher's daughter, Sumaya. Uh, that's Mahmoud's youngest daughter. And um, he met us at the airport with uh, Flower Lays. And then he took off work and um, toured us all over the island for the whole time that we were on Oahu. And so that relationship is enduring and I traveled to Sudan with this background in yoga, which um, is still something that I carry with me at, at some level. Uh, uh, what I found is that there is a distinct difference between yoga and um, Islam. And I think it was maybe Abdurrahim Araya, who was one of the um, sheikhs and leaders in the house that I stayed in, um, Beit al Aleph, Brothers House A, who helped me understand that in yoga, one is focus, focusing on, con concentrating on, um, attaining more power, more abilities, more endurance, and so forth. He said, Islam is almost the opposite. You're emptying yourself, right, to um, submit to the creator's will. And that was very helpful in, in my own development to see that distinction. And, and so I saw it as a transition. I saw yoga not as something um, distinctly different than um, the practices that I was now engaged in as a Muslim, but they were by degree different and leading in, I think, to different types of outcomes. And so I just wanted to share that because that was a a big moment of transition for me. It's when I stopped um, sitting in cross leg poses and started sitting with my legs to the side more like the uh, Prophet Muhammad taught and started to th really think deeply about this idea of the difference between concentrating one's power and submitting to the ultimate power. So I arrived with Salman in Gadarif. This is Salman's uh, family. This is his wife's family here. This is his brother, Mustafa, and some of his friends in Gadarif. And I love Gadarif. Uh, the first thing about it, it felt like I was in Africa <laughs> because they're living in traditional thatched homes. And 
uh, in a compound and you sleep outdoors on a rope bed. And I just, I just felt um, just so at ease. I just, uh, it, reinf it reaffirmed to me that I had made the right decision to sell everything I own and to focus on learning the Islam that Sheikh Mohammed said existed in Sudan. That was my mission. And arriving in Gadardif reinforced the idea that I had made a good decision because I just loved it. The other thing was that I arrived in August, which was Ramadan. And the beautiful uh, th experiences that I had was uh, breaking the fast and walking to different um, neighbors' homes on these um, earthen paths under the moonlight <laughs> or, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, eating a different meal at each person's home. Uh, the, the, just the smells, the fragrances, the, the way in which people greeted one another. We went into the market at night and I did a little trading in the market. I wasn't very good at it. I found out the, uh, some of the merchants told Salman, he said, he's a really nice guy, but he doesn't know much about the souk. He doesn't know much about, about buying and selling things and stuff, which was true. Uh, Salman, uh, wife, Maimuna's family, uh, this, these are her, her sisters, her four sisters, and her oldest sister's children. I think three of these are her older sister's children. Uh, standing here is uh, Sayeda. Uh, there's a story that I'll tell about hers. Once I, once I move to, um, to Umdurman and I meet Ustaz Mahmoud, um, uh, I'm meeting with some of the brothers, and the brothers are the brothers are um, doing like a triage with me to make sure I kind of um, understand what the expectations are for a devotee of Ustaz Mahmoud. And they're a little bit preoccupied with my goatee at the time. So I had not only a mustache, but a beard at the time. And they were telling me that um, we, you know, unlike m m most traditional Muslims, do not associate your facial hair with your religion. You don't have to have a beard, right, in order to be a Muslim. You know, you don't have to carry a sipha to be a Muslim. It's not what you wear, it's not your facial hair and so forth. It's your, it's your mind and your heart. It's the content of your character, it's how you carry yourself. And I bought into that immediately. That just made sense to me. The other ver um, notion I always had a question about, but I told the brothers that I don't associate facial hair with, with religion. This is my culture. And it just means that, you know, I'm a pretty cool dude, that I'm, I'm, I'm a man and I'm cool. I got my goatee, got my facial hair. And the brothers tried and I, was, I wasn't, that was the one thing that we were stuck on. And then Salman came and picked me up and we went back to Gadarif. And when we were there, his uh, wife's sister, Seda said to me, Abdullah, Deganek Shane, <laughs> Abdullah, your, your beard is ugly. I shaved the beard the next day with no problem at all. So that's just a little bit about my character, but also with my infatuation with Seda at the time. So I met Ustaz Mahmoud, right? I'd only been in Sudan now less than three weeks. I came during Ramadan. At the end of Ramadan, we went to um, Umdurman. Salman had a good friend, Marani, who lived in Umdurman, uh, who lived in, I want to say he lived in Khartoum, but he knew where Ustaz lived in uh, Umderman, and we traveled together one evening. And we arrived there um, just after the brothers and sisters had left for the book distribution. And so Stas was basically, you know, just a few people in his meeting room, they called it the salon, with him. And uh, after he conducted a little business, he turned to me and gave me his full attention. And um, I've talked about um, my first impression of him was even before he came into room, how the brothers were anticipating and sisters were anticipating his arrival. They were, they were, they were sitting in with, with, in with great expectation and they were sitting in a very humble posture. Some of the brothers holding their knees and things like that. And I was just um, focusing on that. And I said, wow, who's getting, who's arriving, you know? And I saw when the staff came into the moon, he came into the um, room fully present, dressed in white, 
and his spirit filled the room when he walked into the room. He was a tremendously powerful person. That was my perception of him. But at the same time, humble and graceful at the same time. And you know, his story is, is really important. Ustas was also a um, proud Sudanese person. He was very much that, you know, he was, he was, he was a defender of Sudan, of his culture. And when in the 40s, uh, he graduates from the University of Khartoum as an engineer in 1936. And he worked brief, he worked as an engineer for a while. But at the same time, he was looking at the political situation in Sudan. And he was very critical of the idea that the um, Sudanese were having, uh, political parties were having a conversation as whether should we should come under British control or Egyptian control. Mustaf said we should be completely independent of both. That was his position. And he refused, in fact, to um, sign any type of agreement that said that he would not um, uh, engage in activities against the government. And this sent him to pres prison in 1946. He had just formed the party. And he was on prison for a short period of time in 46. And then his um, party, which had just been formed, organized a mass protest and the governor general of Sudan released it. But during, during that time, um, Ustas was, was very uh, defiant towards the, um, towards the British and, the, and dismissive of the parties that were saying that Sudan need to be governed by either um, Egypt or um, England. He felt that the Sudanese had the capacity to stand on their own feet as an independent nation, and he's advocating for this. And it's fair, I think it is significant that Sudan is one of the earliest countries to gain its independence on the continent of Africa. It's independent in 1956, right? And this man is the one of the earliest people to, if not the earliest, to articulate, right, that full independence posture, right, which he's doing in 1946. Uh, I also was attracted to the Sudan. This is a, a Dinka from, from the southern Sudan. And I had uh, close relationships with the Dinka because Ustas um, gave me the, ooh, the, he greenlighted me going out and speaking on Fikir Jamhuria. Again, I was indebted to some of the brothers like Assam Bushi, um, Matt Bushi, uh, Abdul Harim. Abdul Rahim, uh, Araya, who were teaching me as much as they could on the fly at night. And so I had something to say. I read what was in English. I had them to ask questions of and some of the other brothers. But Ustas really kind of, I would almost say, honored me with the uh, ability to go out early and to speak on these ideas. Right? And so the, I only spoke English clearly. And so I was speaking a lot to Southerners and then different Kawajat, uh, the foreigners that I would encounter in the cities. I'll talk a little bit more about that. But this is uh, my affinity towards the Southern Sudan is also very strong. And the, uh, the dissolution of the Sudan into two nations was hurtful, is hurtful because in my heart, I feel it's one nation. So early on, uh, I met Mukhtar, this Mukhtar in the upper right. Uh, he is the nephew of Ustas Mahmoud and he took it upon himself to befriend me. He had a studio at the time. Uh, he invited me into the studio. He taught me how to develop film. He assisted me in learning more about photography. And these are some of the photos that I took in the studio as I was learning that he was taking of me and as I was learning the process during that time. And this is a picture that I actually, I believe I took of Ustas Mahmoud, the one in the upper right. And this would have been uh, 1978 when I was uh, in uh, Studio Mukhtar. So Ustas Mahmoud, this is a picture I took also uh, during the same time. This is out in front of his home, very humble abode. And 
This saying by Eustasis is what I think really captures what one would have experienced in meeting him or could experience in meeting him. And that is that he was, he seemed to be constantly in the presence of our creator. That was just the impression you got about him. Um, fully present, um, always compassionate, sensitive to everybody's needs, very clear in his ideas. He said things once, <laughs> you know, they were very clear. And this saying of his, I think, captures captures that is that it it's that notion of of submitting to the will of god to the point that you become not only mm, patient with what your experience is but content with it and then when you become content you move from contentment to greater contentment and even towards being joyful with god's decisions no for you no matter what they are and if you know anything about Ustaz Mahmoud's life or his death, right? He was content with God's will to the moment he left this earth physically. And from my perspective, every moment that I was there, that I encountered him in between, content. That doesn't mean you're content with everything. Doesn't mean that anything goes. No, he had a very he had a running critique against the 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 governments, against the um, sectarian parties, against the um, traditionalists and fun, and so-called fundamentalist Muslims. I say so-called because they're not really talking about the fundamentals of Islam. They are trying to to take Islam forward by moving backward to a time in the past. Ustaz's clarity around the two messages of Islam is something that I might take a moment to, to kind of talk about. His, his clarity with regards to the Quran is a manifestation of his worship. And even historically, we know that it was during the time that the British arrested him for the second time in 1948, where he was in prison for two years to 1950. And then another, no, they arrested him in 48. He was in prison until, in 46, he was in prison until 48. And then another, uh, and then again, he went into self-imposed khalwa or isolation for another three years. Basically what I'm trying to say is, is it was during a five year uh, consecutive period between 46 and 51 where Ustaz Mahmoud dedica dedicated himself to the path of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, that he gained his insight into Islam. His insight into Islam came first with his insight into what is the path, what is the distinction between Islamic law and the path of the Holy Prophet. He's very clear in helping us understand that though he was the perfect man for the seventh century, and he introduced the code of the seventh century, Islamic law, he lived by another code. And the difference between him and even the best Muslim, who most people would say is Abu Bakr, is the difference between Sharia and Sunnah. Ustaz Muhammad talks about that. The difference between the Holy Prophet Muhammad and Abu Bakr is the difference between Sunnah and Sharia. And Ustaz makes that distinction. So he's got he's he's distinguishing between Islamic law and the personal behavior of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, and instructing us that the personal behavior of the Holy Prophet Muhammad is the way out of our current dilemma. How does he know this? Through application, starting in that five-year period, because it allowed him to articulate now the second message of Islam. He's sharing with us that Islam is not one monolithic me message. Islam is the final revelation from our only God, codified in, a, in the Quran, that same Quran that you can find 360 on this earth. It's the same Quran. But the understanding of that Quran is at issue. Thinking that Islamic law 
and the behavior of the prophet, sh sh that's Sharia and Sunnah, and religion itself are the same thing as many scholars seem to do, is mistaken. Ustas is saying that's three different levels. You're going, you're going from the ground to the tariq of the Holy Prophet to infinity, to Allah. How is that one level? Deen, Sunnah, and Sharia. I mean, his argumentation is very clear. But what's more important is his articulation of these fundamental ideas of how to reinterpret Mecca and Medina how to understand the difference between Islamic law and the personal practice of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Like, for instance, Muslims pray five times a day. That's Sharia. The Prophet prayed as an obligation six times a day. Those things like that. And moving to now his articulation that there are within the Quran revealed to the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, two distinct levels which represent two distinct messages, both of them brought by the Holy Prophet Muhammad. His insight came through his adherence to the path of the Holy Prophet Muhammad and his clarity that he gained through that adherence. And, you know, he, he, he bases it on the Quran. There's verses in the Quran saying that if you, you know, you commit to, the, to, to God, then God will, will teach you. You know, and if, you know, and the prophet talks about how if you commit to the path of God, then he will teach you those things that you that you don't know. This is this is fundamental to Islam. Anyway, this is a picture I took of Ustas who will be 1978 or 79. I'm pretty sure I took this picture. Somebody can challenge me on that. Um, with his daughter Asma, uh, Asma behind. I say it's in September 77. So I'm not sure the exact date of it, but it's early. Uh, it was when I was still doing black and white pictures. So it could have been late 77, 78 would have been in that period. All right. Now, to the movement. On the left is me. And so I was, when, after the conversation with the brothers that I was telling you about, we went and we were distributed in one of the four houses. So I was I was actually placed in the house that's closest to the home of Ustaz Mahmoud, literally a two minute walk from his home. And that's Beit al Alif. These are some of my brothers. And we lived in like a commune. We were responsible for paying the rent because all of us were working. Most of us were teachers. And we also were had different days that we were responsible for the cooking, where one maybe two people were responsible. One would go to the market and bring it, and the other person would prepare it. And we basically organized ourselves to run the house. And when I say we, you're talking at any time between um, 10 and 20 people in the house. Sometimes when we would have what's called mutamar, where we would have an assembly of brothers coming and sisters coming in, the, our house would fill up with brothers and we would have, you know, 30 maybe. But typically we would have that number around, say, 15. Um, this was our little kitchen area in here. We live quite humbly. Uh, this was my room here just behind the kitchen. And uh, I had a rope bed inside that I was very pleased with because it had metal poles. It was left to me by one of the sheikhs, uh, Assam Bushi, when he left. I was very pleased to have that bed. It was, it was uh, the most comfortable rope that you've ever slept on. This was our uh, kitchen area where Bashir is uh, doing dishes. All of us took turns doing it. This is the this is the Oda, a room that was right next to my room. And um, this was the um, printing office. So the, the Republicans printed our own book. So Stas Mahmoud's position was he wasn't going to accept, accept advertisement in our, because he was offered it in our publications. He says, because if you have advertisers, then they will have influence, they can influence your message. And he didn't want to have any outside influence. And so we did all of our own writing, printing, publishing. And most of it occurred in that room right there in Beit al Quran Aleph. And we had brothers that were dedicated to it morning, noon, and night. So that was our, 
our daily activities um, in the house, as I said, would be around in the morning. We would we would get up if you if you had an early morning uh, schedule, you would shower. Um, pr we pray together, sunrise prayer, just before sunrise. Then we would have a, a small meeting, and then after the meeting, depending upon your schedule, uh, if you hadn't showered, you would shower and you'd head off to work. Um, when you came home, the lunch, the lunch meal would be being prepared or ready. You would eat, and then after you finished um, eating, it would be time for your Asr prayer, your third prayer. You'd pray Asr, and then you would prepare yourself for our evening activities. And so we were scheduled every evening to go out and do work. So there were, there were four different houses, and um, brother's house A, B, D, and G. Aleph, Ba, Jim, and Dal in Arabic, a little bit different in the Latin script. And each house would then have its own uh, community. And as I said, that community sometimes would, would could be small and sometimes you would have guests. Like we have here guests from Port Sudan and um, guests from the United States and, and, and so forth in our, in our house. So the, the numbers would fluctuate but the activities in each house were very similar. And they were all, I would say, orchestrated by Ustaz Mahmoud. And the interesting thing about it is that we, you were free to do whatever you wanted, you know, within the ex, um, acceptability of Sudanese culture, that is, right? But I mean, the, you were not obligated to show up anywhere. You had to make that decision yourself. You were not obligated to dress a certain way. You were not obligated to, to participate in any way if you didn't feel like doing it. So you had freedom. And that freedom put a lot of pressure on people to have to govern themselves, to self-govern themselves. And this was a huge part of, of our, our movement is that you had to develop self-discipline. And you know sometimes that takes time to understand that message. So after um, our Asa prayer from each of the four houses, we would march chanting Allah, 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 as we walk through the streets in procession. We called it Masira from each of the four houses. And we would arrive at Ustasa's house. This is a shot of Ustasa's house here. This shot is a little bit more recent than those first uh, three years. This is Ustasa's house. This is a side of his house. And this means that we're going to have a large gathering when we meet here. A smaller gathering would have been held in front of his house. This is the front here, but this is the front across the street. And so again, it's a large gathering when we moved in. So Ustasa's house was on a corner and it had two huge areas that we could congregate in on each side. It was ideally located. But once we arrived there, our Munshidin, those who would lead the zikr, they, so the chorus would be Allah, 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 and the Munshadin would be hitting Allah, 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 like that. And we would chant until it was time for the Mughrib prayer. That was daily, or at least six days a week. Right? So you got off on Friday, usually. And this is again chanting on the way to Estas house, going through the street, we were known as the, the people were called the Allah Allah people, Nas Allah Allah or whatever, which was, which was not. Most of the community had a good impression of us, the people that knew us, because we behaved ourselves and we were always, when they would see us, we'd be chanting God or praying and so forth. And so we had a good impression in the community. When we arrived at the house, the sisters lived in Beit al the sisters lived in Beta Lustas, right? Um, they used the term, they referred, they referred to Ustas as a buoy of Ustas, most of them. They wouldn't just say Ustas, revered teacher. That's not enough. My father, revered teacher, is how many of the sisters uh, referred to Ustas. And so their, their um, commitment to, 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 the, to the ideology and to the path was sometimes really palpable. It was amazing. 
Uh, so this is again in Zikr. This is a shot of me in Zikr. It was very meditative as we would be chanting and then it would lead into prayer. Ustaz Mahmoud many times would be in the center and he would be in his zone, in his place, right? As we zikr. So that was uh, part of our daily discipline. And then once we arrived um, and, and finished praying Mughra prayer, the transportation would come and we would get in the transportation. Here's a shot of me on the bus. I actually was there. And we, the transportation would take us wherever our destinations were. Often it was to the markets in the three towns because, you know, um, Sudan is like um, a tri-city. Um, um, Khartoum is a tri-city. Khartoum, Umdurman, and Khartoum North are on different sides of the three Niles. The Blue Nile, the White Nile meet in Khartoum and form the River Nile. So we would go to the different um, markets in the tri-cities. We would go to college campuses. You know, it could be um, Cairo University in Khartoum, University of Khartoum, Khartoum Medical School, the, the College of Education. We would go to different campuses and we would have our free platform discussions, usually with a, a different publication talking about issues that were relevant to people in that moment. Sometimes it would be religious issues, political issues, um, um, critique of the government. Uh, and, um, yeah, so that was kind of our activity on a daily basis. This was the leading brother from Ustaz uh, Saeed. Uh, I always felt blessed because when he came to stay with us, he was actually uh, from Wad Medani. That's where he was located. And uh, uh, the, the, the sisters from Wad Medani were very unique in, this, in the way in which they loved this man, right? Uh, he, he walked on, he, you know, he like, I won't say he walked on water, but he was highly revered by everybody. And, and I always felt honored because when he came to, to Khartoum, he stayed not only in Beit al Quran Aleph, but he stayed in my room, our room, the room I slept in, and my bed, right? And I felt very blessed to be able to allow him to do that as I go sleep wherever, right? I, I looked at that as a, as a blessing, really, when he, when he would be in town. So that's our big brother. This is our big brother, Jalal, and some of the other leaders, like Talab, and of course, the sisters, who are a heavy part of this. It was the sisters who... I think first uh, impressed me that night that I met Ustaz Mahmoud. It was a bus that had just returned from book distribution that was coming um, back to report to Ustaz Mahmoud. And on the side of the, uh, and in the front of the bus were sitting the sisters and everybody was chanting Allah. And so when I came out with Salman and Merani after meeting Ustaz Mahmoud for the first time, I was struck by, I heard this sound, this beautiful chanting, and then this bus came, and then there was just white light coming out of the, out of the bus. And uh, it, it was really coming from the sisters up in the front of the bus and the brothers in the back. The, um, let's see, yeah. So the Socratic method, I wanna talk a little bit about that. Um, Ustaz, Ustaz had a very, uh, he deserved the moniker Ustaz, teacher, because he, 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 the way in which we were structured was one in which, as I was telling you, we had the freedom to develop on our own and to develop our own internal motiv motivation and commitment to this movement. It really was a movement. But he also had certain practices that we engaged in. And it was only through a conversation with one of my colleagues who taught political science that I realized that it was the Socratic method. In fact, he realized it and told me that it was the Socratic method. And I said, yeah, it is. But what I mean by that is after we would go out and, and conduct our free platforms, male and female, and, and women going out in the streets 
of an Islamic country and engaging men in discourse is revolutionary. It's revolutionary in 2021 and was even more revolutionary in, I would say, um, 19, uh, the 1960s and 70s when it was happening in, in Sudan. But in, a, in addition to that, when we would come back, we would sit outside of his home in Jelsa, in, in a sitting, and we would share our experiences. Only people who had something to say would share. What interesting conversation did you engage in? Share it. And so people would come and then they would start sharing their ideas and other people would sit and they would listen. And sometimes the senior brothers would then make a comment and occasionally Ustaz Mahmoud would make a comment. But what it was, was that notion of, of requiring people to express their ideas in a public forum and to refine their ideas and to refine their understanding in the process. That was structured into our daily behavior. We went out six times a day after work. So you work your, 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 your job, you come home and, and pray, eat, pray, and then you go into your hamla, you zikr until the sun sets, you get on those buses, you go out and you come. Now it's, it's evening, it's night now. You're coming back and you're sharing and you're going through this process of learning. And it was very, it was structured in a way that, let me see. There was one occasion where um, in, instead of people talking about what they had ex experienced in the street, people were talking about a question that Ustaz had had given us to contemplate. So sometimes he would give us a question like um, uh, contemplating what year it is. Did the, Ar did the Arabic calendar start from year one or did it start from zero, zero? What year is it actually? And we'd have to go back and have a conversation about that, right? And, and mathematicians would disagree on this, on this question. And so it became a very intriguing kind of idea. But in one of those conversations, uh, during the report back, or the, some of the senior brothers spoke first and they had a lot to say. You know, they're not, they're, they're called the responsibles, the giadin, those that have knowledge, they spoke. And after they spoke, it was uh, in closing, and this is a staff style. He didn't, he didn't immediately after they speak, critique them. He let the entire process carry out, right? And then he in introduced some other business. And then in closing, he said, and by the way, a best practice is when we're having a conversation, right? Dis discussing um, issues in this manner that the, the Gyarin, the more knowledgeable ones, wait and allow others to, to speak first. This opens up the discussion and gives people the, encourages those, right, who don't have that same knowledge and status to share their ideas and to develop them, themselves. To speak can sometimes intimidate others into sharing their ideas. And he did it in such a graceful and so forth way, but it was super teaching. It was like, how to refine the Socratic method, right? And I just saw, and he just, little gems like that would just flow out of him from time to time. So that was it. And sometimes uh, when we were out in the markets or we were at the college, um, Cairo University in Khartoum or at the University of Khartoum, we would be singing our hymns. We sung them every opportunity. So anytime really we had any formal sitting with, with Ustaz Mahmoud, there would be um, hymns sung. That was almost without exception, right? Male and female singing these spiritual hymns. And this is something for me, I came out of the tradition of men and women singing in the church. So it wasn't unusual for me at all to hear men and women singing. I came from a background where men and women sat together in class, in church, and so forth. And so it wasn't unusual for men and women to be sitting in the same room and sharing. 
and talking about religion. For me, that's natural and it just makes sense. In the context of Islamic law, it is something that is um, at, the, at the level of reform, if not revolutionary, right? Something so basic in terms of Islamic law. And this is that importance, the necess necessity for us to distinguish between the law and the teachings of the prophet and the example of the prophet. Because the notion of the, the law, as Ustaz teaches, is based upon guardianship. And men are guardians over women. But the prophet standard that was established particularly in Mecca and even beyond that in his own personal behavior was one of equity and justice. And that's why it's critically important to distinguish between Sharia and Sunnah, because equity and justice is obviously what we need to move forward today. And not, not, not Muslims being guardians over non-Muslims. That leads to South Sudan, that mentality. Or men thinking that somehow they're guardians over women. Women born as individuals, they, they live um, in the presence of their God as individuals. They will be judged on the day of judgment as individuals, right? And none of these so-called guardians are gonna be asked anything on that day. So we need to get that clear. Sisters will be speaking at these events. This is Batul, she was the leading sister. And this is, I believe, at Cairo University, Khartoum. We would have our mara, we would have exhibits where we would bring in um, these artistic posters, as well as books, various different books on different topics. And the students were just um, soaking this, this information and this atmosphere and the spirit up. You know, it was like in a, it was like a critical, critically important aspect of their education. I was at University of Khartoum at this time. And so I, I was able to absorb, absorb the free platform conducted mainly by Ahmed Dali at the University of Khartoum. And it was really something to behold, the reverence that the students held that meeting into. Sometimes it degenerated into um, violence because the Muslim brothers, that's how they communicate. But the notion of equity and equality is the sisters, the knowledgeable sisters spoke. And Ustaz encouraged everyone to speak their mind. He said, if a person is honest, then what they say has value. You don't have to have all the knowledge. But exercising one's freedom responsibly, articulating, articulating your thoughts is an important aspect of becoming a free person. Free in the context of human society, not free in the way in which it's often interpreted in this society, where freedom becomes me doing whatever I want to express my needs at this moment. Think about that. If each of us just expressed ourselves in any manner, not governed by custom, by law, by tradition, by culture, if we just did that, we would be not much different than wild animals, but it certainly would be a chaotic situation. So there cannot be freedom. Freedom requires, as Ustaz clearly articulates, a person to, well, he, he defines it as thinking what you want, saying what you think, and doing what you say, with the provision that what you say and what you do doesn't harm other people. Why? because we have to preserve and promote and develop human society. What else, why else are we here if that's not our mission, right? What are we here for? To, got, to die and to go to heaven? What is that? You know, what, 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 what's the purpose of that? God needs us to just come here and, and, be, and be idle, right? And to not develop. Um, why are we, why have we descended here in the first place? I think that's an issue that we do need to contemplate. And the notion of um, um, exercising our freedom while we're here in a responsible manner where we use discretion 
is critically important. And to not to understand that leads to things like what happened on, what was that, June 6th at the capital of the United States. People thinking that they're behaving like free people, other folks looking at it and say you're behaving like wild animals. Yeah. Part of uh, what we would do was uh, attend weddings and let's see, how are we doing in terms of time? I need to, we started at, yeah, we started at nine. Okay, so I wanna, I'm gonna close down because I wanna leave time for questions. And so let me just uh, end here. I'll say that um, it's a good place to end, that part of what um, the Jem Hurin, the, the, the students and the followers of Estes Mahmoud tried to do was, was to live, particularly during this period when I arrived in 1977. They were trying to, to, to live but as close to this code that we're professing as we could. And so one of the traditions that had developed in the Sudan was that weddings, weddings would be super expensive and everybody would try to do more than the person who married before them. And they became so extravagant that a lot of people couldn't, couldn't afford them. Or if they could afford them, they would then be broke after their wedding. They wouldn't have any money because they spend it all on the wedding. So we followed the law, the letter of the law, but our weddings were only the dowry in the wedding was only a pound because the notion is, is that once Islamic law is articulated based upon the revelations from Mecca, then the dowry itself will no longer exist, right? It's associated more with an earlier time when women were thought of as chattel and so forth. But we had it. And so we had these weddings that, that where people would pay this uh, symbolic um, Sudanese pound, which was way less than a dollar at most of the time I was in Sudan, as an example. But they were joyous occasions. And uh, these are examples uh, at the wedding. Uh, Ustash usually did not officiate. He did here because his, uh, his niece was get, getting married and she insisted that he be there. And so he was. But typically it would be other brothers who were, who were presiding. We would always have uh, our hymns being sung. You would always find me with my, with my camera. And they were the part of the most delightful aspects of my time in the, in the Sudan uh, between 1977 and 83. So I'm gonna stop here. This is thought of as a series. I wanna pick it up and um, speak um, more about the um, second and the third phase. And I'll start from here with the second phase and that should be sometime um, maybe in, in the coming month. So let me stop and take questions at this time. Okay, thank you, Abdullah, for the outstanding presentation and the eloquent speech. We have a fair, the first question is from Mariam Subdik, Mariam Amin Subdik. Uh, she wants you to speak about the self criticism sense. Yalsat and Naqd al Dadi. So that's, if, if I understand the question, that's a, that's a, that's a critical. Um, critical question in terms of one's development. Um, to be able to... Excuse me, you can stop the presentation, Abdullah, so you can see your face. Okay. Abdullah, is the question clear to you? I, I think so, but uh, let me... Stopping the presentation might not be. So I just should I hit... Not stop the recording. What do you want me to do? Leave? No, no you already did. You already did. Oh, okay. Thank you, whoever did it. Hi, everybody. Good to see you all. Repeat the question. I think I understood it, but let's, let's start with a clear understanding. It is, uh, the, would you please speak about the self-criticism sessions? In, in other words, I mean, other words, it's about the sessions where the Republicans criticize themselves. Okay, but that's not clear because are we talking about something that happened in a collective or are you talking about the self-criticism that we engage in on a regular basis as part of um, um, taqwa which i mean, you know are we talking about personal self self-criticism as a way to develop one's self 
Are we talking about? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, that, that, right? yes to okay. develop oneself and to develop the movement, to advance oh. the movement. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. I'll try to. I think one I have more insight into than the other. Yes. Uh, as you remember, Ustad Mahmoud said, who does not see a defect in his work, that means his work is defective. Okay. That's a good place to start. Yes. Yeah. I mean, the, it, it starts from the standpoint, and we all know this, that we're all imperfect. And uh, one of the things that helped me to, to understand that simple point, which shouldn't be controversial, is we're limited. Our sight is limited. Our hearing is limited, right? Our memory is limited. We're limited. And so that's, that's the nature of our design as human beings. We're limited by design. With those limitations, we have capacity. And part of that capacity is to discern what is right and what is wrong, what is good, what is bad, what is healthy, what is unhealthy. And it's our, and it's our job then to pay attention to our behavior, our speech, and our actions, and to critique ourselves when we're not doing something that is um, acceptable in the sight of God. The words that I know in Arabic that are used are mahasaba, maragaba. So I think it's maragaba first and then mahasaba. Maragaba, paying attention, which means you need to be present, present with yourself and present with your surroundings so that you can observe the interaction and make sure that your interaction is acceptable in the sight of God not harming other people. Ustaz Mahmoud is a master at this. And I gave you an example earlier where the way in which he spoke to the brothers who he, he wanted to step back and allow more, right? That's a form of critique. That's a public critique. But he did it in such a kind way because it wasn't right after their behavior. And it was done as a, in a very matter of fact way that this is, a better, this is the best practice, you see? So the, 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 the idea is that one has to pay attention, but one also has to develop the, the skills, the compassion, the humility, right? To respond to a situation in a way that you're actually going to create a better outcome. So moragaba, being present. And, and worship is the way to be present, right? It's, worship, it's our worship that allows us to live in the present moment, present before God and carrying our worship. And this is the Stas 101, Stas' teachings. He says, it's not from Bismillah to Salaamu Alaikum. You have to concern yourself with Salaamu Alaikum to Bismillah. When you go out into the world, be present, be worshipful, be compassionate, be a Muslim, be a Muslim. Submit to the will of God. That's God's creature. That's God's creation. How are you interacting with it, right? So that, that, that piece about Muragaba is about being present, but then having the, the skill set in the moment to do no harm, to shed more light than fire. And that's, that requires worship as well. That's something that's acquired over time through trial and error and application. That's the mahasabha. That's when you're now uh, observing your behavior and um, trying to um, cr criticize those things that could be better, right? To improve one's interaction. It's ma'amala. The goal is, if you say deen is ma'amala, the goal is to constantly be improving your deen through better ma'amala. Does that make sense? So for me, you know, self-criticism is, the, is, is um, obviously a critical aspect of, of self-growth. And as Asari shared, um, one cannot, cannot grow unless they are um, engaged in it. And criticizing others is a different issue. 
is it's a different issue, you know. And I, I will come at that from like a saying, a teaching of Christ. Christ said, How is it that you concern yourself with that speck in your brother's eye instead of the twig or the log in your own eye? And so it, it, it means, obviously, that one needs to start with themselves. If we spend our time critiquing ourselves, we don't have that much time to be criticizing and critiquing other people. All of us are works in progress, meaning each of us has infinite opportunities to improve, right? And the improvement should first focus on self and not on others. And that's a, that's a great teaching. It's a hard thing to follow. I know for me, it's a hard thing to follow because it's, you know, the way in which we're, we're programmed often is to see the problem outside of ourself. That's just, that's just our nature, you know, um, because it's, it's the way in which we're designed in the world. It's us and it's them, right? But many times it's, it's important to, 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 to look for that common ground and that common understanding, which, 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 which allows us to step back and not necessarily see someone's behavior as being directed towards us, being intentionally trying to harm us, you know? Because I've, you know, I've taught for a long time and I ha I've had many times where I've had to catch myself from responding to a student in an inappropriate way, coming to a quick judgment about why that student's behaving like that. Oh, they just disrespect me. You know, I have to sometimes catch myself doing that and think, are there other possible interpretations? And, and, and one of the things I, I, I took back from the Sudan and I've shared it with people is this idea of husnazan. The idea that if you have more than one possible interpretations of something, take the better interpretation, it's better for you. That's a form of reserving judgment, right? Reserving judgment of others and reflecting on one's own tendency to jump to conclusions. So that's kind of what I would, I would say about that. And I think it, it's obviously, it's tied to Ustas's teachings in a very direct way. Because when you talk about following Tariq Muhammad and adhering to his worship practice, the way he fasted, and the way, the way he treated people at the end of the day, the way he treated people. That's the example. I mean, he, he went to war with people who killed his brothers and killed his followers, who killed women, children, and stuff, and he forgave them. He didn't take retribution on him when he conquered, right? When he conquered Mecca, when he came back and conquered Mecca, he didn't, he didn't seek retribution. Why? Because of the way he understands the unity of existence. And that's, that's, that's important. This, this whole concept about we are our brother's keeper, whether our brother or our sister, right? is behaving properly or not. They're God's creation. And nothing is happening outside of God's will. This is a profound kind of understanding of the unity of existence that um, is promoted by Ustaz Mahmoud. It's a, it's a very um, practical application of it, right? It's that idea of husnazan. Yeah, you're hurt. It hurt when that person said that or, and, and, the, and they did that. But Ustaz said, try to see the hand behind the hand. And I guess, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm trying to tie this to self-criticism, right? But it's, it's, it's that idea of not being so critical of others. That's where I'm going with this, right? But yes. see, seeing the hand behind the hand, meaning, meaning that that which just happened to you can and most likely should be looked at as a test. 
how are you going to how are you going to respond how are you going to behave are you going to ignore the hand behind the hand and just blame that person that's immediately in front of you and try to harm them in in a similar way that they harmed you well that's been the story of humanity since our early existence we've got to figure out a way to overcome that and Ustaz's articulation of the second message of Islam is a useful method because the Holy Prophet Muhammad exemplified that high moral character in his behavior. He was not someone who was vindictive, who took retribution on people. And he forgave what many people would say are unfor unforgivable acts. You know, when you talk about them, killing innocent women and children, that type of thing. They're unforgivable, right? You, you, you could feel justified in retaliating, but he didn't. And that's the example that we're trying. And the, and the, and the answer to the question, why didn't he, right? Well, because he was a prophet, he's perfect. Yeah, but also because of his closeness to his creator, right? He was constantly in a worshipful state what Ustaz Mahmoud is saying from Salaamu Alaikum to Bismillah. Yeah, you know, I, I, I think about that a lot, but I, I'll, I'll leave it open for other questions. I think, uh, thanks for that question. Okay, thank you, Abdullah. It was really an excellent question and answer. And hopefully we'll be able to uh, put in the website some speeches from Ustaz about the self-criticism. Okay, so, that'd be great. I'll read them. Yeah, and uh, the next question is from Mrs. Raja Bashir. Would you please unmute yourself? Uh, sure. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, Jamian. Uh, Professor uh, Abdullah, I am harmful and, and uh, grateful to, to listen to you today. It's uh, Raja Bashir, I, and uh, I was pleased to meet you and the early 80s at the University of Khartoum. Inshallah. And I was uh, really uh, uh, connected to uh, the sisters and brothers from Al-Fikra. Uh, but, but I commit uh, myself to Al-Fikra recently in last uh, uh, April. Inshallah. And then uh, uh, my question is, uh, I see all of the attendants now are the Sudanese. Uh, do you have any haraka within the American society and especially uh, the youth? Uh -huh. uh, because I have a son who is uh, 16 years old and I truly need him to join Al Fikra. Uh, but you know, around this age, uh, they are always uh, like the, uh, they, they, uh, they, uh, they respond to the do the youth and the, the peers and you know uh, uh, the, the, the around this age and then um, yeah, and and also I try to get your uh, some of your uh, videos and and let him listen but uh, if there is any youth around like the the this uh, age or maybe a little uh, older uh, that would be wonderful uh, if you have any haraka within the the American society. And then, um, uh, because uh, he may listen to the videos, but it depends on his mood, you know. Uh, but 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 definitely the interaction between uh, the the boys or or even the boys or girls the around this age will give like a, definitely a positive uh, results. So if you have any um, haraka within the youth, I really appreciate it to know them. Mm -hmm. uh, wow. Professor Abdullah, we are approaching the end of the time, so this will be the last question. Ah, uh, okay. So now, because right now it's two twenty-nine. Okay. So we can just go beyond the time Raga, by, he, by five minutes. Okay, Raga, I, I would just say thank you for that. Um, I need to be doing more with the youth. I do have, you know, outreach to youth, but on a on an individual basis, former students and that type of thing, and. A couple have shown up today, but nothing sustained other than, you know, these videos that I'm doing or speeches and so forth. And I feel like I need to do more. Um, I know that it is, um, it's, it's difficult 
in these times with uh, all the distractions that that young people have to deal with uh, in this society. And then when you layer in um, uh, religious differences and the various different interpretations of what is right, it's just uh, young people are in an overload type of uh, situation and they do, they do need ways to filter out some of the noise and get to some of the, the light. And I think your, your efforts you know, with your, with your son are like many people. Uh, they don't always bear fruit immediately, but in time he will appreciate them more and we do have to be patient with them. But I will say that um, to, directing him towards um, El Fikra, the, the website, is, is helpful. And um, I can only, on this is anecdotal, but I would be happy to talk to him in, any time um, I can introduce himself. I'd be happy to talk to him. Uh, with that, I think for today, because of time considerations, we want to go ahead and, and uh, end this session. And as I said, I had another two sessions planned. It might turn into three additional ones. And we definitely will, not definitely, but inshallah, we'll be offering them in the uh, coming three months. So with that, I'll just say, um, Assalamu Alaikum wa shukran to everybody. Um, Abdul Hajj and um, Ismail, Azhari, Omar, and everybody else in, in attendance. Thank you, Abdul Rahim, Abdul Rahim Araya. I saw you at one point, whether you're here still or not, I just want to say Mustagin. Uh, <laughs> it'll be very nice, very nice to see you. And um, Ma Salama. That's very nice. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, I guess, can you just repeat the, the phone uh, one more time, please? I'll, I'll, give it you, I'll give it to you right now. Salad. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yes. And our Sudali is attending and uh -huh. I'm I'm to to thank you all for attending this wonderful presentation. Abdullah has a museum. So one day we can uh, establish Abdullah's museum. <laughs> Let's... Uh, yeah. Yeah. We'll, yeah. We'll so now we'll say we'll say goodbye. Everybody, be safe. Stay safe. We will conclude this in answer now, Abdullah. Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna anzalnahu fi Laila al-Qadr, wa ma adraka ma Laila al-Qadr. Laila al-Qadr khayr min alf shah. Tanzil al-Malaika wa al-Ruh fiha bi izn Rabbihim min kull am. سلام هي حتى مطلع الفجر صدق الله العظيم صدق الله العظيم شكرا لكم جميعا وان شاء الله نلتقي في اقرب فرصه طبعا زي ما عارفين دال عنده الركن الاسبوع يوم الجمعه وان شاء الله عبد الله يكون عنده محاضره الشهر القادم ان شاء الله المحاضره كانت مؤجله من لانه الشهر الماضي ما كان عندنا محاضره عملناها الشهر هذا شكرا لكم شكرا جزيلا الله حفظنا امين امين